I am going to Tom Bilyeu's house now to do impact theory. And that might not seem very glamorous to say that I'm going to someone's house to do a podcast, but wait till you see this house. It's insane. Second COVID test of the day. If you don't try, you can't fail. And if you don't put yourself out there, you can't feel like a piece of shit if you fall short. So there's real, there's real courage in the earnestness, in the effort, in trying. went well, but the Hollywood Hills are not designed for large trucks like this, nor is my truck fancy enough for this neighborhood. I almost hit a Bentley on the way in. But now I have to back down this crazy hard driveway. Well, I did it and I did not get in an accident, but it's pretty narrow. I don't know how people live up here. As a adopted Texan, I'm used to unlimited space, very large parking spots, and almost no hills whatsoever. I've actually known Tom since he was at Quest Nutrition. He had this show called Inside Quest. We've become friends. He's had me on a bunch of times. He took COVID protocols super serious. He took a test. I took two tests. Then we wore masks, socially distanced until we did the thing. So I felt really good about that. We try to serve the common good, or at least try not to negatively impact the common good with our uh, decisions or selfishness or whatever. Now I'm off to my next interview with Adam Grand Mason of No Jumper. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking to him. Now it's true, Marx really says in meditations that life is warfare and a journey far from home. But he also talks about tucking your kids into bed at night. And he says that you can't take this for granted because you don't know how much time you have with them. The big question is why didn't I just fly here? Wouldn't that have been a lot faster and easier? The real reason is the pandemic has changed me in the sense that I now find it very hard to be away from my kids unnecessarily. For all the craziness and all the stress, that's been the best part of it. The best part of this is not getting to go promote the book and tell people about it and hopefully sell lots of copies, which is good for my life and good for my business and hopefully good for the messages of the book. But I don't have to miss time with my kids. Second run in LA is finished. We are packing up and then we are going on our mini road trip inside of our road trip to go see my 85 year old grandmother who I haven't gotten to see since the beginning of the pandemic. And I want to see the great grandchildren. I don't know if it's one last time, but it's been too long. You never know how long we have with someone. So that's the next trip.
when I dropped out of college, my grandfather was the only one that believed in me. It tore my whole family apart. My parents reacted as horribly as parents could possibly react to something like that. But my, my grandfather actually believed in me. And we talked almost every day on the phone. And I don't know if I've ever said this, but he died in 2011. And I flew from his funeral here in Sacramento on the red eye to New York City where I sold my first book. So he not only missed me having kids, which he would have loved, but uh, you know, he missed sort of what it was building towards, like what he'd supported me through and what he believed in me to do. I mean, I guess, I guess he knew, right? Just barely overlapped. I don't think I told him, I don't think I told anyone that I was working on the book. I actually haven't been back. I haven't been able to see it until today. So it hit me pretty hard, but it was good to take the kids here. The stoic take on this memento mori stuff is that every time you see someone, it could be the last time you, you see them, but this probably is the last time I see my grandma. Man, quite a day. Apparently a big wildfire. We're going up the grapevine to go back down into LA. Okay, you want me to hold you out the window? I don't think you want that, bud. <laughs> We've come to a complete stop on the five freeway. There was also a car crash. And so, you can see five lanes away. It's going down to one lane, and apparently that's been the hold up the whole time. We'll see. It is 9.49 p.m. We made it, took a long roundabout way. Kids were great, slept in the car. We are now almost a full day of driving, cumulatively delayed on this trip. But it's a wonderful, peaceful night. The kids are in bed, we're gonna hang out. Nothing to complain about. I'm heading now to Beverly Hills. I'm gonna do the Lewis Howes podcast. I've known Lewis forever. Actually, I set Lewis up with Robert Greene, who he had on as the first guest ever on the School of Greatness podcast. Took the kids to the beach this morning, did some writing for the Daily Dad email, spent some family time, and now it's back to the podcast grind. doing a drive I have done many, many, many times that takes me way back to when I was a research assistant. I lived in Koreatown, I lived downtown, I lived all over LA, and uh, I found myself Continue driving usually for three quarters of late mile. at night to see 
Robert Greene or drop off research papers or books that he had me read. I have to go give Robert a copy of Courage is Calling, which I'm very excited about. But most of all, I get to pick up a copy of his new book called The Daily Laws, which you can also pre-order. Someone who I would not be here without. He's actually the godfather, literally, to my oldest son. And I have not seen him since, I think, like, late 2019. So it's been a very long time. And uh, I'm gonna go spend some time with him. The great man of history theory feels silly compared to the idea of like systemic oppression and and that like it's easier to be cynical and say that it's hopeless and broken than to courageously like believe in or be committed to anything. Right, right. Which is sad. It is sad. Well, that's why I think that this book is so important because you bring it down to the level of the individual. So we often think like it's we think in large big paint strokes of society at large for change, that we all have to organize, etc. But it comes down actually to individuals making certain decisions and cert taking certain actions that are courageous. That was amazing. Anytime I get to spend with Robert, I'm so grateful for it. I always feel very lucky. I always feel like I'm wasting his time a little bit, but just to be in the presence of someone who, one is just so fucking good at what they do, so unassuming about it, so sort of quietly wise. And then it's just been so generous to me since, since I started. So one of the things I talked about with Lewis in my interview with Lewis was that writing a book is kind of like doing a marathon. You do this long marathon, you put everything you have into it, you leave nothing on the table, you think you're absolutely out of gas, and then they lead you over to the starting line of a second marathon. That's what the marketing is. That's what the promotion is. Some authors are just like not willing to do it. They, they feel like entitled, They'd rather just do the creative stuff. They think it's beneath them. Maybe they're scared of it. They don't like being in public. To me, like, the marketing is a huge part of a project. I mean, what does it say about the project that you don't feel that it's worth promoting, that you don't feel that it's worth communicating to people why they should care and why it's good? To me, that, that says a lot, but more importantly, what does it say that you can't do that, right? It tells people that this is not interesting, that it's not good, that you don't actually understand it. Richard Feynman says, you know, like if you can't teach it at an elementary school level, like you don't actually understand it. If I can't get up on an interview and explain to people what courage is, if I can't do it on a comedy podcast, if I can't do it on a radio show, if I can't do it in all these different mediums, if I can't explain to people why they should care, why this is interesting, why this matters, it's probably a sign that I didn't do a good job. To me, the marketing is, is not just an important key part of the obligation, it's also proof of whether you've got the goods or not. So like, when some people are afraid to promote their work or they feel self-conscious telling people about it, they don't wanna be overly self-promotional, I'm like, no, you're sending the wrong message. Next up is actually my last interview of this whole series. I'm going to see my dear friend, Rich Roll, whose podcast I've done before. He's been an awesome supporter of the book. So hopefully we will really get into it.
Well, the marketing part of the tour is over. I've got one last place to go. It's been both exhausting and fun, a little bit of a grind, but again, it's part of the job. I'm excited to do it. I guess the stoic idea as I wrap this part of the trip up is like, I did my part. I did my best. I agreed to do all the interviews I could. I showed up, I made the time, I did the trek, I did the drive out here. And now this is the part where you gotta hand it off. You gotta, you gotta accept that a certain amount of it is not up to you and you go from there. If you wanna learn more about stoic philosophy, totally for free, you can sign up for a daily stoic email. It's one free email every morning, the best of stoic wisdom, dailystoic.com slash email.